I'm gonna beat you up. <laughs> I have that on recording. Prove it's me. <laughs> Prove it's who? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't do anything. Mm hmm. Welcome back to another episode of Is Fitz Happy? I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. And this week we're discussing chapter nine of Mad Ship, Bingtown. We are with Paragon, the first part of this chapter, and it has picked up where, uh, well, the last that we heard from them, he and Amber had made a plan that she was going to burn him before Mingsley or any of the new traders could come and take him and disassemble him. And she is going to try her hardest to stop the sale from happening in the first place. Right. So this is picking up from there where she has now moved on to the ship so that she can guard him 24-7. Well, not 24-7 because she still goes to work. Yeah. But, you know, at least overnight. Yeah, she's moved everything into Paragon, kind of shuffled brash and stuff aside, uh, brought aboard her woodworking oils and things like that and her finishes and it's a kind of self-deception Paragon notes that she's just storing them inside of him and not using those as the oils to ignite in case of an emergency. Right. Um, Paragon also notes that when Amber moved Brash and stuff, she was really um, polite about it. It seemed like she handled them thoughtfully before moving them to a different room. So it's not like she ruffle or rummage through them to see what it was or who it belonged to or try to get anything out of it she just put it all in a neat pile and put it in a different room which i think is an important thing because we know that amber is the fool and the fool seems to have a reverence for sacred spaces like your own space and your own things like those things need like shouldn't be really touched by other people yeah and through the silver on the fingers can get a history of the item true kind of a glimpse into that that past there right but i don't i don't know if that's what she was doing necessarily here yeah maybe not no we know that she did that with all the sailors items that she could find aboard the paragon the like the boxes of cards and things like that Mm, fair enough i guess maybe just not here though yeah maybe definitely possible because as you said the fool is a very well beloved is a very private person and respects that. So Paragon kind of details that they're settling into a rhythm where she is living aboard him. Every day at daybreak, she would bring a bucket into town when she went to work and come back with a bucket full of water and cook and bustle around inside him singing nonsense songs to herself if the evening was fine, she could a cook fire and talk to him while she prepared her simple meal. In a way, it was pleasant to have company on a daily basis. In another way, it chafed him. He had grown accustomed to his solitude. Even in the midst of a companionable talk, he would know that their arrangement was temporary. All humans did was temporary. How else could it be with creatures who died? Even if she stayed with him the rest of her life, she would still eventually be gone. Once he had grasped that thought, he could not be rid of it. To know that his days with Amber must, eventually, come to an end gave him a feeling of waiting. He hated waiting. Better to be done with it and have her gone than to spend all his time with her waiting for the day she would leave him. Often it made him cross and short-spoken with her. It's a horrible way to live life, but we know Paragon is a, a deeply broken being. There's a lot of trauma with uh, deaths in general and right. change. Yeah. And I mean, he is someone who is abandoned a lot. So I can see why it would be hard to open yourself up to someone when you are, as far as we can tell, an immortal being and right. the person spending time with you, as far as he knows, is going to have a normal lifespan of like 90 years. So that's like not not a ton of years. And he know he he doesn't have a sense of like somebody will come along after amber and so that's even worse that like he gets a small respite and then has to 
go on knowing how good it was without being completely alone. Right. I do feel bad for him, but it does also give me the vibe of whenever you're hanging out with a pet and then remember that your dog is going to die like significantly before you, significantly more time before you do. And you start like mourning and it's a puppy and like, <laughs> and this dog has like multiple years left, but you know, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Maybe something I do, but it's something that happens and the thought comes, but we move past it. Right. But Paragon seems to dwell on those kinds of thoughts. Right. And instead of just like accepting the company and the joy that it brings now, he is only thinking ahead to how hard it's going to be after. Yeah. So might as well get it over with now. But they're both in a relatively fine mood tonight. Tonight they had had a merry evening together. She had insisted on teaching him a silly song, and then they had sung it together, first as a duet for two voices, and then as a round. He had discovered he liked singing. She had taught him other things as well, not weaving a hammock. That he had learned from Brashen. He did not think she knew such sailorly skills. However, she had given him softwood and an oversized blade that he might try his hand at her trade. Sometimes she played another game with him, one that was somewhat unsettling. With a long, light pole, she would reach up to tap him gently. The game was that he must bat the pole aside. She praised him most when he could deflect the tip before it actually touched him. He was getting good at the game. If he concentrated, he could almost feel the pole by the slight movement of air that it caused. Another fiction between them was that this was just a game. He recognized it for what it was, a drill in skills that might help him protect himself if it came to a direct attack. How long could he protect himself? He smiled grimly into the darkness, long enough for Amber to be able to kindle fires inside him. And he moves on thinking about What's bringing her bad dreams? Because he can, he's looking in within now, thinking about Amber, and she is tossing and turning. Right. And clearly in the midst of a nightmare, which seems to be a regular occurrence for Amber, he's noted, but um, this time they seem very bad. Yeah. He remarks that sometimes when the nightmares were upon her, it took her a long time to struggle back to wakefulness. So... That thought makes him lift his voice and say, Amber, Amber, wake up. It's only a dream. He calls out once again, and she does wake up, thrashing violently. She pads outside and says, thank you for waking me, I think. You wish to remain in your nightmare? He was puzzled. I understood such experiences were unpleasant, almost as unpleasant as living through the reality. She, of course, says, of course, yeah, they're, they're unpleasant. But sometimes, when such a dream comes repeatedly, it is because I am meant to experience it and heed it. After a time, such dreams can come to make sense. Sometimes. What did you dream? Paragon asked unwillingly. She laughed unevenly. The same one. Serpents and dragons. The nine-fingered slave boy. Moreover, I hear your voice, calling warnings and threats. But you are not you. You are someone else. And there is something. I don't know. It all tatters away like cobwebs in the wind. The more I grasp after it, the worse I rend it. Before we go on as to what Paragon does or does not wish to share about serpents and dragons. Mm -hmm. The dream is, of course, something that we know about. She had mentioned it earlier, early in the book. Whispering about the nine-fingered slave boy. On the docks, I believe, when Althea met her mm -hmm. the first time. And of course, we know that to be Wintrow. Right. And then she hears Paragon's voice calling warnings and threats. But you are not you. You are someone else. Is that actually Paragon reaching through? The, the dragon parts of him reaching through to her in her dreams? Do you think that's part of Kennet that is in Paragon reaching through? Or do you think it's just kind of a Paragon is important, but he is not who he becomes later on in the series yet? Hmm. Or do you kind of breeze past it? I'm not really sure what to make of it. Part of me wonders if maybe it's Fitz calling. And because we know that Amber carves eyes back onto Paragon and makes him look like Fitz. And so it's Fitz calling 
but it's Paragon. And so it's Paragon, mm. but not Paragon. Maybe. Or, you know, just like something like that. It could be that it's more of the future than what even happens in this book, because I think it's not till next the next Rainwild Chronicles that they figure out that the ships can turn into dragons, right? Right. So it would be odd, in my opinion, for Paragon to be somebody else or something else like the dragon, because that doesn't really happen in this book. But maybe it's referencing the fact that it, at the end of this book, all of the ships become aware that they were dragons at one point, right? Yeah, something like that. I mean, Paragon, obviously Vivacia figures it out and her dragon half comes forward as Bolt for a while. Right. Paragon reaches into those memories a bit and then becomes whole when kind of dies on his deck. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they fully address it really with Paragon yet. I mean, I think there there is talk of it, and I think Paragon does open up, but I don't think it's a main part like Vivacious is. Mm. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I'm not really sure how to read into it. One of those things that, like the fool said, in ages gone by, some old men will look back and debate whether this meant this or what. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely... It's definitely hard to decide... Because, I mean, really, you could look into it more, especially because at the start of the chapter, or no, even just in the past of talking about how he was waking Amber from the nightmares, Amber is whimpering and pleading in her dreams. And that struck me as somewhat odd, because I don't know why she'd be whimpering and pleading in this book at all. But if you think about it in the context of what is to come, she does, like, go through some pretty rough things true so i don't know if there's like part of that being interpreted in the dream or that's why i was wondering if it was kenneth's part of paragon reaching out and mm. whispering warnings because that's like the hurt and the the pain that kenneth felt as a boy who was whimpering and pleading and i don't know that definitely could be it could i don't know why it would happen though that's right what... <laughs> yeah no it definitely is hard to tell and especially because we don't get a good like even amber doesn't seem to quite grasp the the fullness of the dream um it's harder for us to then try to interpret it i guess right like i think sometimes amber as the fool gave us more concrete dreams to like kind of decipher through and see if we could figure out or more hints that had more to them to try to figure out what the future held but this is more abstract i guess yeah true and Paragon also says, serpents and dragons. He tried to laugh skeptically. I've taken the measure of serpents in my day. I do not think much of them. However, there are no such things as dragons. I think your dream is only a nasty dream, Amber. Set it aside and tell me a story to clear our minds. Amber says, I think not. Her dream had shaken her more than Paragon had thought. For if I tried to tell stories tonight, I would tell you of the dragons I have seen, flying overhead against the blue sky. It was not so many years ago, and not so far to the north of here. I will tell you this, Paragon, were you to tie up in Six Duchies Harbor, and tell the folk there that there were no such thing as dragons, they would scoff at you for foolish beliefs. First, though, they would have to get used to the idea that there are truly such a thing as a live ship— until I saw one and heard him speak, I had believed life ships were only a wild tale concocted to enhance the reputation of the Bingtown traders. Did you truly find us that strange? Paragon demanded. He felt her turn her head to gaze up at him. One of the strangest things about you, my dear, is that you have no idea how wondrous you are. Really? He fished for another compliment. You are fully as marvelous as the dragons I saw. She had expected the comparison to please him. He sensed that, but instead it made him uneasy. Was she fishing for secrets? She'd get none from him. And so she talks a little bit more about these dragons and how they are a treasure trove. Sometimes, like, you're going through life and you save up these precious things, and sometimes 
all at once it seems to fall on your lap and that's what these dragons were all different kinds of colors shapes sizes flying and they were wonderful and her voice dies away and paragon says they weren't real dragons then i tell you i saw them she insisted you saw something or at least something that had stolen the shapes of dragons nevertheless they were not real dragons as well as to say you saw green, blue, and purple horses, some of which had six legs and some shaped like cats. Such things would not be horses at all. Whatever it was you saw, they were not dragons. Well, but... It pleased him to hear her flounder for words. She, who was usually so glib, he didn't help her. Some were dragons, she finally defended herself. Some were shaped and colored just as the dragons I have seen in ancient scrolls and tapestries. Some of your flying things were shaped like dragons and some like cats. As well to say that flying cats are real, and sometimes they are shaped like dragons. She was silent for a time, and then she asks, Why is it so essential to your happiness that there be no such thing as dragons? Why are you so intent on crushing the wonder I felt at the sight of those creatures winging? It isn't. I don't. I simply believe that one should say what one means. I don't care that you wondered at them. I just don't think you should call such things dragons. Why? If there is no such thing as dragons, what does it matter what I call creatures I saw? Why should not I name them dragons if that name pleases me? Because, he declared, suddenly nettled beyond all reason, because if there were any such thing as dragons still, it would demean them to be grouped with such grotesques. Suddenly she sat up straight. He felt her shift away from him. He could almost feel her prying stare trying to pierce the darkness and see what little the hatchet had left of his face. You know something, she accused him. You know something about dragons and you know something about my dream and what it means, don't you? So I read quite a bit there, but we have Amber and this is probably... I don't know, this is probably the... One of the final big clues before the Fitz reveal that this is the fool. Yes. <laughs> Where she's talking about six duchies and the dragons that she saw and wondering and at. dreams. Uh, she's yep, specifically dreams. dreaming and the dreams are important and mm -hmm. it's about dragons and serpents. So definitely related in some way. I think, yeah, like you said, the, the last big reveal before it's official, there's no way to deny. I want to hear... Any of you listening out there did not figure out this was the fool all the way through the trilogy. I'd be really curious to hear because like you could have read this one first, right? Mm -hmm. This trilogy, you could have read this after all of the other ones. I don't know. It, it could definitely happen. But if you're reading them in order, I think this is kind of a big clue, at least reading them like we did one after another after another. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's too many similarities to put down. Yeah, definitely. I think it would be, I guess I could see if you took a lot of time in between the first trilogy and this trilogy, how you would maybe miss it. But yeah, I'd definitely also be curious to know if any of our listeners didn't catch it. Yeah, which means that they wouldn't know that Paragon looked like Fitz. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be interesting. But anyways, so. So there's this big argument. Happening, yeah. And it's because I think. The undercurrent is that Paragon's dragon side does not like to be compared to these things that are definitely not dragons. Yes, the too prideful to yes even contemplate that comparison. Which in the Rainwild Chronicles, I believe the dragons there also share a similar, uh, a similar th thought or yeah feelings about it. Even Tentangula, I think, has something about how those are mockeries or something they they're they're yeah basically art. art to honor us but don't call them real because they're not yeah so it definitely points towards paragon being dragon-esque or right. at least knowing more than he lets on even in his inner dialogue to us the reader and then it also shows how little amber knows it also right. makes me think about how 
it would make sense why the fool is so confused at the end of last trilogy because they probably still were having the dreams of dragons and not understanding why that didn't stop because they brought dragons back. It happened, but not really quite grasping why it would be that those stone dragons aren't the thing that they were pursuing their whole life. And so being here and realizing the missing connection, I think especially with this chapter, if you are a big fan or a rereader or just know enough about the series you can really get that sense of like that's the missing link this is the problem this is why it wasn't enough and why the fool had to leave because they didn't bring back dragons but it does make me wonder why Fitz was so important if those weren't the dragons that needed to be released or or whatever you know what I mean like I don't know because it seems like fool believes Fitz is integral to bringing back the dragons which i guess he is eventually he is yeah. necessary all those events were extremely necessary for ice fire to get released mm, fair because without the end of the red ship war six duchies is overrun there's nobody to go to that island and release them the pale woman who's working her machinations in the mm-hmm. background will eventually get there and they'll try to kill him i think or something because mm-hmm. She's part of the actual, the four, like she's under the direction of the four at Claris, right? right? Yeah. They want to get rid of all the serpents and dragons. So Ice Fire is extremely important to be freed, to mate with Tintaglia, and to pass along the memories from before the Cataclysm. True, yeah. Because the new dragons from the Rainwild Chronicles are way too human to be like the old dragons. Yeah. So it's definitely different there. So Ice Fire is like the last remaining pure dragon. Pure dragon. The Tinglia. Tinglia too, but she's been around humans for so long. True. Um, but she is, yeah, but like a classic dragon. Mm-hmm. But Ice Fire is way older than her. True. Yeah. So it's is still very necessary, in my opinion. Okay. It's just very. You have to connect all the dots together a little bit. Yeah. I don't know. I, I've seen some discussions about that too because people are wondering like. Well, if the Rainwild dragons hatched, why was Ice Fire necessary to begin with? And people then respond, oh, then maybe Tintaglia would have stayed and mothered them and they would have never gotten on their feet, you know, and yeah. gone on the adventure to find Kelsingra. And so Ice Fire is necessary to draw her away and pass along the memories. And then it all comes back to Fitz surviving when he was a baby. <laughs> yeah. Which is crazy that they're all interconnected like that. And the fact that. Yeah. I mean, I know every once in a while we bring up things that like maybe are contingency problems, but like how many, but there's 16, 17 books, 16, 16 books, and they're all interconnected this deeply. And you can see the like path of logic between the domino of Fitz being born to the end of the series. Right. I don't know. Very cool. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. But that's anyway, something that definitely was coming to the forefront of my mind with this conversation specifically between them and especially how fool like Amber is in this moment. Oh, yeah. Like I definitely see the fool's personality more. That verbal trap. Yeah. And also the like. I I don't want to say arrogance because I feel like arrogance has like a bad tinge to it, but sort of the arrogance or of. I'm an important person and I know that this is an important dream and I don't care that you don't believe me and you're making fun, but I need to know what you know so I can make sense of my dream. Right. Like that attitude is so fool like to me that I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's the fool. Of course. (laughs) I don't know. It's, there are definitely like little bits of the fool that peek through, through Amber throughout, I think, but that this, especially where when she, brings forward the like why is it so detrimental to your happiness that these dragons that i saw don't exist right it felt very like fool calling fits out yeah it's like oh if dragons don't exist at all why does it matter if i call these things dragons Mm -hmm. and then paragon's like well if there were dragons still around they would hate being compared to these (laughs) (laughs) yeah so i don't know i just I like it a lot. And I guess like, it's not like this doesn't seem, this seems out of character for Amber. Like it doesn't, it still is very much Amber, but I think this is just the most overlap I've seen between the personalities of fool and Amber. Yeah. Yeah. And so Amber is convinced that he knows something now that Paragon knows something Yeah, and says, I don't even know what you dreamed. And I've never seen any dragons. 
not even in your dreams? Her soft question was insidious, as insidious as drifting fog. Don't touch me, he warned her suddenly. I wasn't going to, she said, but he did not believe her. If she touched him skin to wood and reached hard enough, she would know if he were lying. That was not fair. He couldn't do that to her. Do you ever dream of dragons? She asked him. It was a direct question asked in a casual voice. He did not fall for it. No. Are you sure? I thought you had spoken to me about such dreams once. He shrugged an elaborate charade and kind of pretends like, oh, well, maybe I did, but I forgot now. So it wasn't important. You know, not all dreams are important. Mm -hmm. And Amber says, mine are. I know they are. That is why it is so distressing when I cannot grasp what they mean. Oh, Paragon, I fear I've made an error. I pray it is not a grievous one. He smiled into the darkness. Well, how grievous an error can a bead maker commit? I'm sure you are troubling yourself over nothing. Dragons and sea serpents, indeed. What do such fantastic creatures have to do with you and me? Sea serpents! Amber suddenly exclaimed. Ah! For a long time she was silent. Then he almost felt the warmth of her smile wash against him. Sea serpents, she affirmed to herself softly. Thank you, Paragon. Thank you for that much. It's kind of surprising to me that Amber didn't realize that the serpents were sea serpents until now. It was to me, too. But then I remember that we're reading like Malkin <laughs> and yeah. Shriver's perspectives. And but she lives in a port city and people talk about the serpents all the time. I guess they probably call them sea yeah. serpents. But if she's having dreams about serpents, wouldn't they look like the sea serpents? Well, she's never going to have seen one. I suppose. And maybe they don't talk about them all the time because most people who are there are going to be people who are visiting a bead maker shop. So it's going to be the families of the traders. And as we know, the women of these days don't really care for talking shop. <laughs> sure. But Amber also goes to the docks regularly. True. That's true. And so that's why. And I feel like especially on the docks, you're going to hear the, the tales of, of oh, serpents, we saw yeah. serpents. And we know at the beginning of this book that the serpent population has grown recently and that's a big talking point mm -hmm. that like a lot of the traders seem to talk about how it's really annoying to sail right now because of the serpents it could be because she doesn't want to make the assumption and having someone who obviously knows something make that connection for her mm. solidifies it in her mind i don't know yeah i don't know but either way that part really confused me i'm like I don't know why this is such a revelation. It feels, especially because when she first talks about her dream, Paragon's response is, I've battled many serpents and it's fine. Like, again, what kind of serpents is he talking about then if not a sea serpent? And like, <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, I like the way it's done because it has a good feeling of like he unintentionally or maybe intentionally let a little detail slip and she knows more, but it also feels like she should have known it before now. Right. So I don't know. But overall, it is a really good discussion and proves that he is lying to her because I think Amber is far enough to figure out the reason he doesn't want to be touched is so she can't tell he's lying, which right. is an even bigger tell. <laughs> like, <laughs> So we move on to Althea's point of view. She is still aboard Ophelia, on their way back to Bingtown now. Things are starting to converge a little bit. Right. And they are going to get to Bingtown the next day. Like, it's nighttime, but mm -hmm. the next morning they should be in Bingtown. And because of that, Althea can't really sleep. She's up by Ophelia, who says, you know, it's not your watch. Now, obviously, Althea <laughs> replies, you know that as well as I do. And she's excited but not in a good way to go to bingtown she replies to ophelia i fear i must i fear all i must face tomorrow my sister my mother kyle perhaps if vivacia is there oh ophelia i even dread facing my ship when the time comes how can i look at her and explain how and why i let her go you know that you will not have to just put your hand to her planking and she will feel it all as surely i do it's such a wonder to me, the understanding that has developed between us, Althea says. It is another reason I dread docking in Bingtown tomorrow. I have felt so safe aboard you. I hate to leave you. I think 
this is a really good insight into Ophelia and Althea's growing relationship. And I really like their friendship that they have. Yeah. I like that Ophelia is not a traditional a modern traditional woman that Althea would be used to and she gets to have kind of a good role model and somebody in her corner for once I feel like who also challenges her yes like I feel like that's the problem with Althea is her dad was kind of a pushover and didn't challenge her enough in anything that she was doing it was too like daddy's girl (laughs) and then everybody else just hated her for being different so like I love that she has somebody who is supporting her in that way. That is an important way to support somebody where you call them out when they're being bad or making bad choices. And it's still in a loving way. Like she definitely has needed that. And so I'm glad to see this, but it also just is so heartbreaking to hear like how nervous and upset she is for what's coming. This is a really big deal. And I think it is good that we start hearing this nerves because it, puts us as on a reminder about why the proposal from Greg came at such a bad time. Like there's just so much happening in her personal life right. that there's not much room left to think about love. And so, yeah, so then we get Greg coming mm-hmm. and he is described as walking tigerishly, which I noted because I think it's one of the only times, if not the only time, a man is described with uh, cat-like characteristics. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that that was pointed out. Greg is hot enough to be cat-like. <laughs> he moved across the moonlit deck, his bare feet falling softly. He wore only his trousers. His hair was tousled and boyish. Obviously, he was recently awakened, yet there was still a tigerish grace to his gait as he crossed the deck. A slow smile crept across Althea's face. Very softly, Ophelia answered her thought. Men have no concept of their own beauty. Before we go on, that also made me think of a point that I wanted to bring up. Ophelia and Althea seem to have a pretty good connection, even though they're not related. Yeah. Like they have a really open for, like line of mental communication and are able to Ophelia is able to read her thoughts in a way which I think goes towards the theory that Kenneth is right you can sway live ships to your side. Yeah, I definitely think so. I and we talked about that too. There yeah. has to be I think both sides have to reach for it and with Althea being so lonely and wanting that connection and her being used to doing that yeah. with Vivacia, it made it easier for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. But I think this is just in case anybody mm-hmm. is like, uh, I don't really know if it's possible. I feel like right. this is just another textual example of like, clearly the bond is something that can be formed organically. And I think because we got last chapter from Vivacia that it's stronger with people who are blood relation and have bled on the deck like, obviously, there's still a deeper connection with the Teneras, but I think if, like, all the Teneras died, she could sail for Althea because she's picked Althea. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, not that I want them to die. <laughs> just, <laughs> just a theory that is ongoing. <laughs> so, Greg grins as he approaches, saying, I tapped at your door. When I didn't find you there, I knew right away where to look. Oh, Ophelia broke in archly. Are you in the habit of tapping at Althea's door at this hour, with no shirt on? Only when my father wakes me up and asks me to, Greg replied easily. He said he wanted to have a quiet talk with both of us. I was not to be included in this quiet talk, Ophelia demanded, already offended. I assume you were, since he asked me to wake Althea and bid her to come here. I thought you might even have suggested it. No, it's my idea. Captain Sneera stepped quietly into their circle. Call me a fearful old man if you will, but there are some precautions I'd like to take before we dock in Bingtown, and they involve Althea. His serious tone quenched their banter. And Althea asks what he he, he has in mind, and he talks about his fears of the Chalcedian galley, something that Althea, and by the look on Greg's face, they both kind of just brushed out of their mind. Not that, that it wasn't a serious matter, and bearing thought it just was in the past now right obviously captain tanira was a little bit more thoughtful 
Yeah, and not just that, I think Captain Tanira is in a position where he knows a little bit more about the politics going on behind the scenes, whereas I don't know if Greg is really attending all of the old trader meetings. Like, we know Malta was there, but I don't know if that's normal to bring your full family to the meetings. So having, it's not that... I, I don't know, surprising to me that Greg wouldn't have thought about the greater implications, but definitely something that comes with age and somebody like Captain Tanira who would say, you know what, there's been things going wrong in Bingtown, and I think this may be deeper than we originally thought. Right. He basically says that the captain, obviously, flying the satrap's flags, so depending on how much the satrap is groveling to Chelsea and how much influence that captain has, if he could limp his way back to Bingtown, we might have an unwelcome, uh, an unpleasant welcome waiting for them. Right, and it's not just the fact that that they could get an unpleasant welcome. It's that the more he thinks about it, maybe they were telling the truth and they didn't let them board. And like... That's not great to go against a king's rule. So it's going to be really hard to argue that it was like why they didn't allow this guy to board them and check their wares, even though it's clear that they didn't need to. And it was fake, a fake stop. They just were trying to steal stuff like they were the pirates in that situation, the they being the Chalcedians. But if Bingtown is as corrupt as he's fearing because of the new people coming in, then it doesn't really matter and there could they could be detained. Mm-hmm. And he goes on saying that, what's the worst they could do? They could seize my ship when I tied up at the tax dock. Why, they might even take custody of my first mate and me. Then who would go to, te- go to my family to tell what had befallen us? Who would witness to the Bingtown Trader Council and demand their aid? I have many good hands, good sailors one and all, but... He shook his head. Good speakers they are not, nor are they Bingtown traders. Althea grasped it instantly. You want me to go? If you would. Of course, without hesitation. I wonder that you think you need to ask this. Of that I had no doubt, but there is more, I'm afraid. The more I dwell on what may have changed in Bingtown, the less confidence I have of our welcome— To be safe, to be sure, I think it would be best if you resumed your boys' guise. That way, you could be more easily slip away from the ship if you had to. Do you really believe it it is likely to come to that? Greg asked incredulously. Captain Tanira sighed. Son, we carry a spare mass below decks. Why? Not because we are likely to need it, but because someday we may. That is how I prefer to think of this as well. So he's talking about this danger and worst case scenario scenario and preparing for worst case scenario that things have totally turned against the Bingtown traders and they would be completely seized. (laughs) Right. And because Althea is currently acting as the first mate, if first mate is also to be detained, there's nobody to plead the case, right? I guess, like he says, he could send his ship crew and he would have to, but it would be a lot easier for Althea herself to go bear witness. So there's just a lot of things happening, and it is really impressive that he has the foresight to think ahead and to make plans for the contingency. But Greg does not necessarily agree with this method of having Althea slip away in a boy's disguise. He says to his father that he feels like it will put her in danger he's letting her go into danger alone and yeah if it comes to that where she has to slip away yeah and his father says if it comes to this we may actually be helping her slip away from danger before the trap can close on her as well it would be more advantageous to to them to hold hostages from two bingtown trader families than one and this is when ophelia kind of joins the conversation more and is asking them who's them who would dare to stop a Bingtown trader family in In our own waters. Like it doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? Yeah. Satrap Asclepius deeded it to us many years ago. Bingtown is our town. And Tanir responds that Cosgo has been whittling away at that ever since he inherited the mantle of righteousness. 
Others have come to power in Bingtown. At first we paid little heed to the tariff collectors, even when they demanded a tax dock where each ship much must first tie up. We conceded it as sensible. When they demanded the right to inspect cargoes for themselves, rather than take the captain's word on what he carried, we laughed and agreed. It was our town. Their suspicions were offensive, but in much the same way that rude children are offensive. We did not count on this wave of so-called new traitors who would ally with, ally with the satrap's tax collectors to gain power. Nor did any of us ever believe that any satrap would accept Chalced's grubby hand and friendship, let alone permit Chalcedian galleys in our waters under the guise of law and protection. He shook his head to himself. These are the things I have been contemplating tonight, and that is why I have decided to err on the side of cautions. It seems wise, Althea began, but Ophelia broke in. You said they might seize me. I shall not allow it. I did not permit those Chalcedian swine to board me, and I shall not permit. Yes, you shall. Captain Tanira's grave voice stopped her defiance cold. Just as Gregg and I shall permit them to detain us if they attempt it. I have thought this through, my dear, to the bitter dregs. It is time Bingtown awakened. We have been slumbering and letting others chip and nibble away at what is ours. A few days ago, Chalcedian pirates masquerading as the satraps patrol attacked us. A day or so from now, brigands and kidnappers masquerading as lawful tariff collectors may hold us. We shall let them seize us and detain us. Not because we recognize their right to do so, nor because we cannot defy them, but only to show the rest of Bingtown the powers these little upstarts have claimed. The danger must be recognized, while it is still easy to destroy. Therefore, I beg you, if they attempt to seize you, even to put armed guards aboard you, I think we should permit it. They cannot hold us long once Bingtown is roused. Let Ophelia become a rallying point for Bingtown traitor pride. I suppose I shall allow it, she finally conceded, only because you ask it of me. So Captain Sneer here is really thinking about the worst case. He's thinking that, you know, Satrap is gaining too much power here. Chalcedian pigs are gaining way too much power here. <laughs> so if anything, we need to be, we need to wake up the rest of the Bingtown traders because they're not doing anything. So if there is an example made, let me be that volunteer to be made an example of, to be a rallying point. Let yeah. me be the source of outrage. Yeah, and I think this is a really important point of view to get because I know at the beginning of the book we have we have Ronica looking out under the town and realizing that she doesn't really recognize what Bingtown has become in the last couple of years. Right. Which makes sense because she's been dealing with Ethren who's been sick and dying. So she hasn't really been able to even fully participate in society. So of course it's kind of striking to her and she notes that there were things that she noticed changing, but there were more important things to worry about. And so she didn't get into it. And so having perspective from someone in Bingtown that is also old trader that did not have to deal with a lot of family things going on to keep them busy and away from the changes to know why the changes were allowed to happen that this is an arrogance from the Bingtown traders right. they assumed nobody could take from them what they had and were wrong and so I think it is really important that we, even though we've heard this story before, that we hear it in this way so that we can understand better why it's gotten to this point and how it is really important and that people are waking up a little bit to recognize how important it is to take their power back and right. to not be giving it to these people who do not share the same values as they do. Yeah, definitely. And Ophelia finally agrees and Captain Tanira is relieved at, that that is settled, basically. And his glance went from Grag to Althea, and then to the moonlit night above them. I am suddenly weary, he announced. He looked only at Althea. Will you take my watch for me? You seem wide awake. Pleased to do so, sir. You've given me a great deal to mull over. Thank you. Carry on, then, Althea. Good night, Grag. Good night, sir. Just before the captain was out of earshot, Ophelia observed, How sweet, he found a way to leave you two alone in the moonlight. 
which is absolutely what he was thinking yeah so it's hilarious that ophelia calls him out for it Mm -hmm. it's just i think it's cute especially after this like tragic here's what's gonna happen potentially story then to have the uh, the levity of ophelia being ophelia and like "Mm, yeah everybody wants you two to get together (laughs) so greg moves over to a side railing and ophelia with a wink and a toss of her great head, urges Althea to join him there. Althea sighs ruefully and then follows the ship's suggestion. Greg starts off with, you haven't said much to me over the past few days. And Althea's like, well, my, my work's kept me busy. <laughs> I yeah. just want to have earned my ship's ticket, you know? <laughs> right. And uh, just in case you're wondering what this is in reference to, last time we saw them, Greg proposed marriage, but not based yeah. on love, based on business. So, yeah. mm-hmm. so that's why they haven't, been, or that is the last thing that happened. And so obviously Althea has been avoiding him to, mm-hmm. because she doesn't know how to turn him down politely, I think. And I don't know that she necessarily wants to immediately turn him down, but it is very hard to talk to someone after they have proposed to you and you don't know what to say. Right. So Greg, you know, compliments her and says, yeah, you, you already have earned your ship, ship's ticket. No one on board this vessel would ever dispute your ability. However, I do not think you have been truly that busy. I think our last conversation made you uncomfortable. She did not deny it. Instead, she noted, you speak very directly, don't you? I like that. Simple questions usually get simple answers. A man likes to know where he stands. That's reasonable. A woman needs some time to think. Althea tried to keep her tone light, but not flippant. He did not meet her eyes as he pressed her. Most women don't need time to think about whether or not they could love someone. Was there a trace of hurt in his voice? I didn't think that was what you had asked me, Althea replied honestly. I thought the topic under discussion was a possible marriage between us. If you are asking whether I could come to care for you, then I believe the answer is an easy yes. You are thoughtful, courteous, and kind. Althea glanced toward Ophelia. The figurehead was intently motionless, staring over the water. Althea pitched her voice just a trifle louder. Not to mention that you were very handsome and likely to inherit a beautiful ship. As she had hoped, they both laughed, and suddenly the atmosphere eased. Greg reached casually to cover her hand with his. She did not move away, but added in a lower voice. Marriage is not about love alone, especially not a marriage between two Bingtown Trader families. For that is what it would be, not a simple joining of you and me, but an alliance of our families. I have to think of many things. If I married you and went to sea with you, what would become of my own ship? All I have done in the last year, Greg, I have done with an eye to recovering her— Would marrying you mean giving up Vivacia? She faced him and he looked down on her with shadowed eyes. Would you give up the Ophelia to marry me and live with me aboard the Vivacia while I captained her? The shock on his face made it evident he had never considered such a question. And that is but the first of my considerations. I must ask myself, what would I bring to our partnership other than my family's debts? I inherited nothing from my father, Greg. Nothing except the sailing skills he taught me. I am sure my family would give me some sort of a dowry for the sake of respectability, but it would not be what you could usually expect to accompany a trader's daughter. You could get more marrying a three-ships girl. They'd pay richly for the family connection. Kind of, well, I'll finish this section off with his reply to that, saying, Did you think that was why I made my proposal, to see how good an offer your family would make? She replies, no, but... That's that's a co- direct comparison in my eyes to the situation with Malta. Mm-hmm. We have Althea actually thinking as a Bingtown trader's daughter, the considerations between everything. We know that contracts are a really big thing right. in their society and there would be a contract written, but binding the two families together, how would it work with the, the live ships? Right. So it's just a big convoluted mess and obviously... As it's noted in here, Greg didn't think about her captaining Vivacia. I think he was okay with her sailing aboard with him on Ophelia, but yeah. didn't even consider Vivacia in the equation. Right. And I think ultimately this is why I don't find Greg and Althea to be a better couple than Brashen and Althea. 
because as much as I like Greg and he is a nice person, he doesn't think about Althea outside of what she can be to him. If that makes sense. Like, yes, she's her own person and he likes that she's independent and would support her independence so to a certain degree. But he doesn't think about Vivacia, which is her whole deal, <laughs> is the only thing she talks about. Right. And he hasn't thought about it. How much does he actually like her if he can't even give consideration to the live ship that she has been working so hard to get? And... It's hard because he takes this as like, oh, he's offended that she would think that he needs money and like he doesn't care about the money aspect. That's not what this is about. And she's like, well, no, it's not what it's about. But that's something that would hurt my pride. That yeah. I can't give that to you. Like, how does that that puts us on unequal footing? And I feel uncomfortable about that. And the fact that instead of taking that as like. This is something I'm worried about this is why he's like, Oh, you're insulting me. And I just like, I feel bad. Well, I mean, her saying that is kind of insult. <laughs> it, I mean, no, it, it is a little like, Oh, you might just be after money. But like, also he did have a whole thing about how he is willing to pay her debts and knows about them. Like, yeah. so I don't think, I think in that context, it's pretty clear. She knows that he doesn't care about that, but it's something that is worrying her. And he mm -hmm. isn't hearing the, this is my worry. He's hearing you think so little of me that you think I care about money. And that's not what she said. So, <laughs> so like, I don't know. I just, the whole conversation I think is really important because it shows that although Althea up until this point has been a little, I don't want to say immature because it's not necessarily immaturity, but she has been immature and she's not like it. She doesn't seem like as much of an adult, I think, as she should. And now we see that she is an adult. She is thinking things through. And like you said, with that comparison to Malta, she has realistic expectations of what a marriage is and yeah. what happens between two people getting married. And she's thinking about the things that she's bringing to the table. Right. Whereas to Malta, it's just an exciting thing where you get to flirt with people to find a marriage act and then you get a lot of cool stuff. It's not about what she's bringing to the marriage. So yeah, she says, look at it coldly, Greg, to marry you. I must not only give up my ship, but also see her in the hands of a man I despise to marry me. You must give up other partners who might create lucrative alliances for your family. If you consider these aspects, it does not look promising for us. So, yeah, there's just that like back and forth where she is considering and kind of taking his advice of, you know, looking at it from a planning point of view. Yeah. And I think that's good of her to do. And I do think this is an example of a coupling that would do really well in, in different circumstances. Yeah. She does say that she could love Greg. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He's a great person and is fun to be around and respects her clearly. And that is important to her. And she definitely could come to love him. But that's not really everything in a relationship, especially between their families. And it's a lot to think about. It's not just, oh, we get along. Yeah. And Greg, as he usually is, very courteous. He takes in a slow breath and says... I suppose you are right, and just kiss her, you great booby, Ophelia hissed loudly. Althea burst into a laugh that was cut off by Greg's mouth on hers. The kiss was startling, but her body's response to it was shocking. Heat washed through her, and she turned toward him, lifting one hand to his shoulder. She expected him to embrace her and continue the kiss. Before she could wonder how far she would allow him to continue, he lifted his mouth from hers and drew back a little. He would not. This was Greg, not Brashen, she reminded herself. He was ruled by his head and not his passions. She denied the disappointment in the comparison. In the moment that he lifted his mouth from hers, she convinced herself that if he had not broken the kiss, she would have. Greg De Niro was to be taken seriously. He was not an anonymous fling in a distant seaport. How she conducted herself with him would affect the rest of her life in Bingtown. Caution was the better path convincing that, herself yeah yes. that whole thing makes me a little sad because i think if greg would have i don't know the, the best pg way to been say a little this, bit more forward yeah if he would have been more forward and would have continued on the kiss and not just a short little 
quick make out. <laughs> I think she would have kept going until he stopped. I don't know if she would have gone all the way, but like, I think she doesn't trying... matter. She would have fallen more for him. Yeah. And I think this is her rationalizing, not liking him. I think if Brashen didn't exist and she hadn't learned how much she actually cares about Brashen before this, I think she probably could have loved Greg a lot more and oh, yeah. would have this would have swayed her. But the comparison, as she says. Right. Because Brashen is still in her mind. That is who she cares about, as ridiculous as it is. And as much as her mind tries to rationalize it as, well, Brashen's a bad guy, so anything that is like Brashen can't be right or what I actually want. That's right. I want something sensible like this, which just pushes her further away from Greg. <laughs> she takes a breath. Well, she said in a tone intended to convey surprise without affront. Sorry, he muttered and looked aside with a half grin that did not look repentant at all. Ophelia has been bossing me around since I was eight years old. That did sound like a direct order. Althea agreed affably. He covers his hand puts his hand on hers and says there would be difficulties to surmount. That is true of any undertaking. Althea, I ask only that you consider my offer. I could scarcely ask you for an answer now. You have not discussed it with your family. I have not broached the subject with my parents. We do not even know what sort of a storm we shall encounter when we tie up in Bingtown. I'd just like you to consider my offer, that's all. I will, she replied. The night was easy around them, and the clasp of his calloused hand was warm. We finish out that night with her and are back in the morning. So yeah, that kind of concludes Greg and Althea's brief fling. Fling. <laughs> there's there's still there's some still some more like tension, you know? Yeah. They go to uh she I think she goes to Bingtown meetings with them and sits with them yeah um a little bit but brashen is back in the mix soon yeah so i think i think this is the point where it's clear to a reader who's paying attention that it's not going anywhere this isn't happening althea is not in this right she's like convincing her. herself not to be <laughs> yeah and it's very different from the way althea convinces herself not to be interested in brashen because with that it feels more like she really likes him and is trying to pretend like she doesn't. Whereas this feels like she doesn't super like him in that way and is trying to convince herself she does. Like, I, I don't I, No, I think she's she's in, in my mind, in my reading, she likes him a lot, but she is convincing herself that the lack of passion is what is proper. Mm for a Bingtown trader's daughter, right? And, like, the heat of the moment, ruled by his passions, brash, and isn't what she should go for. Why is he on her mind all the time? This is what is actually should be real. I think he, she still does, like, and like you discussed before, yeah. she could come to love him even. It's just the comparison kind of dulls. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't know, it feels like a crush, I don't even know, like a crush on somebody that's like a light crush where you like see somebody you think they're cute you think about them every once in a while and like if they talk to you you get like little butterflies or whatever versus somebody where you're actively trying to be around them all the time and you like have this huge crush on them you're writing their last name in your notebook like <laughs> you know what i mean like there are different levels of crushes and i feel like that's what this is she's writing mrs althea trell in her notebook but she's like oh, yeah greg is cute like <laughs> you know so in the morning, she doesn't know what Greg or Captain Tanira had mentioned to the crew, but no one was surprised that she came out in a ship's boy garb or was dressed as that anymore. And Ophelia enters Bingtown. She also notes that if anybody recognized her as Athel, they were smart enough not to say anything. Right. So she turns her view to home. And she feels a sudden rush of emotion, far stronger than any homesickness. She had been on longer voyages with her father and traveled farther than that than on this last trip. Nevertheless, she felt as if she saw Bingtown for the first time in years. There was a symphony of sights and sounds and smell, and its theme was Bingtown. 
discordant note jarred the harmony as the departure of a, slow, a ship slowly disclosed a Chalcedian galley tied up at the tax dock. The satrap's banner hung flaccid from the single mast. Althea knew at a glance it was not the same galley that had accosted them. This one sported a fanged cat's face upon the figurehead and showed no signs of fire damage. Her frown only deepened. How many galleys were in the Bingtown waters? Why had it been allowed into the harbor at all? I have a quick question because I'm having a really hard time picturing this port area. So they're at the tax dock currently, which you have to do before you can tie up to the regular dock so yeah. you can pay to tie up. Is this like, <laughs> this is why I'm confused because this is how I imagine it. I imagine that like Bingtown itself is like this circular cove sort of deal. Sure. And before you can get into the cove itself, there's like, a dock no, in the right middle. On the no, <laughs> no. No, I think the it's I think since everybody can see ships that are sailing in, they know if you didn't tie up the tax dock. So you just go to this one place first, probably on the side, and then pull further in. And the, yeah, and then go towards like your actual yeah. okay. Cause I'm like, how would they even get like how do my, they have guess, little dinghies they tie up? <laughs> or do they like go from like the dock that people are tying up on to the tax dock? Where they like my my guess is that it's on one of the sides of like that circular cove you're talking mm, about. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Just just a question I had because I'm like I genuinely cannot picture <laughs> this in my mind. I, th- I think there is a map in the last one of the last book of Bangtown Harbor. Maybe this one, but I know the last one because there's more battles and stuff in Bangtown mm-hmm. during that civil war, so well, there is a picture of Bingtown, like the Trader Bay, but it doesn't have any of the like right. docks labeled. Okay. At least in this book specifically. So Althea keeps her thoughts to herself and performs her share of the docking tasks as if she were no more than a ship's boy. When Captain Tanira barked at her to bring his sea bag and follow Snappy, she did not flinch at the unusual order. She sensed he wanted her to witness his meeting with the satrap's tax minister. So she shoulders the bag, follows him while Greg stays aboard, and he goes into the tax office. Clerk greets them, and the uh, the captain slams his fist on the counter, demands to speak with the, with the manager. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's got his hair and wig or his hair and wig on. True, and he wants to. He has a complaint. <laughs> The clerk says, I am in charge here today, sir. Your manifest, please. And Tanira tosses him a bundle of documents. Get me someone down here who can talk of more than coppers and cargo. I have a complaint. Specifically, he says, stick your nose in it, boy, and figure out what I owe. But I have a complaint. <laughs> like, he's really. He's he, coming at this strong. Yeah. He is, I am speaking to the manager no matter what. <laughs> so a guy comes out and says, why are you abusing my assistant? Why is a Chalcedian war galley tied up to a Bingtown dock? Why did a similar galley accost my ship, supposedly in the satrap's name? Since when have the enemies of Jamalia been allowed safe harbor in Bingtown? Tanira punctuated each query with a thud of his fist on the counter. The minister was unruffled. The Chalcedian privateers are agents of the satrap. They have been allowed to dock here since the satrap appointed them guardians of the inside passage. The galleys both reported here formally, presenting their letters of merit. Their sole purpose is to control piracy. They will attack pirates on their ships and in their outlaw settlements. They will also combat the smuggling that supports the pirates. If those miscreants had no market for their stolen goods, their trade would soon cease. The tariff minister paused to straighten a fold of his sleeve. In a bored tone, he resumed, It is true there were some complaints from a few Bingtown residents about the Chalcedian presence, but the tariff dock is the property of the satrap. No one save he can forbid the Chalcedians to tie up here, and he has given his express permission that they may. He gave a small snort of contempt. I do not think the captain of a trading ship can override the satrap's word. This dock may belong to the satrap, but the waters that surround it are Bingtown Harbor, given by a charter to the Bingtown traders. By tradition and by law, we allow no Chalcedian galleys in our waters. The minister replies, Traditions change and laws do also. 
Bingtown is no longer a provincial backwater, Captain Tanira. It is a rapidly growing trade center. It is to Bingtown's benefit that the satrap combats the pirates that infest the waterways. Bingtown should normalize trade with Chalced. Jamelia sees no reason to consider Chalced an enemy. Why should Bingtown? Jamelia does not share a disputed boundary with Chalced. Jamelian farms and settlements have not been raided and burned. Bingtown's hostility towards Chalced is well founded on history, not suspicion. Those ships have no right to be in our harbor. I wonder that the Bingtown Traders' Council has not challenged this. The minister replies that it's not the time to discuss Bingtown uh, internal politics, and his function is to just collect tariffs. So don't, you know, preach at me about that kind of stuff and yeah. don't debate with me. I think it's really important to point out that in the speech that this man that is in charge of the tax doc has pointed out that it's the generosity of the satrap that he's allowing help to be here. So you right. should be grateful. And there's no way you would be able to override the satrap's word. And then as soon as it's proven that they do have the ability, well, this isn't a place to talk politics. So like, it's really just do what I say. And if that doesn't work, well, that's not my job. So you can't make me do anything. And it's, uh, it's really frustrating to read as much as it is. I'm sure for captain Tanira to live it. Right. Yeah. He is definitely getting angry here. Althea almost felt sorry for the clerk because the minister was like, Hey, what's taking you so long about those figures? He was obviously accustomed to being the subject of his minister's displeasure, however, for the clerk only smiled and clattered his tally sticks a bit faster. He's jotting some numbers down, and the minister snatches it away. He runs, runs a finger down the, the numbers with a disapproving glare and says, This is not right. Captain Tanira agrees. I certainly hope not. That is twice what I paid for fees last time, and the percentage on non jamalian woven goods is... Tariffs have gone up, the minister interrupted him. There is also a new surcharge on non jamalian worked metal goods. I believe your tinware falls into that category. Refigure this immediately, accurately. Rinston is a jamalian town, Tommy Tanira declared indignantly. Rinston, like Bingtown, acknowledges Jamalia's rule but is not in Jamalia and is therefore not a jamalian town. You will pay the surcharge. Okay. That I shall not. He exclaims this. Oh, I was so mad reading this. Like, seriously, that doesn't make <laughs> any sense. You can't just make up rules, which apparently he can. But <laughs> to pretend like that'd be like, ugh, I don't know. That'd be like saying, oh, Puerto Rico, while technically being uh, part of the U.S. Part of the U.S. is not the U.S. And therefore you have to pay an extra tax to get something from Puerto Rico. Like, I think that. That might be how it is. <laughs> you know what? Fair. I don't know enough about taxes and politics. Me I'm not, like, I don't know how it works, but it feels like so dumb. <laughs> it so, does feel pretty dumb. Like that doesn't make sense. And this guy knows it. And like, honestly, he probably agrees that it doesn't make sense, but either he's, he's pocketing it or it's just the satrap needs more money to pay Chalced. Yeah. And so that's it. You're going to pay it. Mm -hmm. It's, Ugh, so dumb. So Tanira exclaims out, I shall not pay it. And Althea suppress suppresses a small gasp. She had expected Tanira to bargain over the tariffs that were due. Bargaining was the fabric of Bingtown society. No one ever paid what was first asked. He should have offered a generous bribe to the minister in the form of a lavish meal in a nearby establishment or a selection from the more choice goods on board the Ophelia. Althea had never heard a Bingtown trader simply refuse to pay. So the minister narrows his eyes, gives a shrug, and then says, As you will, it is all one to me. Your ship will remain at this dock, her cargo on board, until the proper fees are paid. Guards, enter please, I may require your assistance here. Tanira doesn't, doesn't even look at him, saying, There is nothing proper about these fees. What is this for patrol, and this for security? How do you expect the satrap to reimburse those he has hired to protect you? Althea had suspected that Tanira's outrage might be some sort of bargaining ploy. Color rose so high in his face that she no longer doubted the sincerity of his anger as he asked, 
You mean those Chelsidian scum, don't you? May Sa close my ears before I hear such idi- idiocy. I won't pay for those pirates to anchor in Bingtown Harbor. So the guards were suddenly standing very close, and Althea, as ship's boy, knows her uh, knows her job is to jump in and assist with a brawl if there if <laughs> needs be. Yeah. So she's sizing up the guards and like, okay, I don't want to do this, but I guess I'll take the smaller one. <laughs> like, <laughs> first of all, the fact that Althea thinks it is going to be a brawl is very funny to me. Like, she is like, I don't know, everything's going upside down. I have no idea what to expect, but I guess I'm gonna get the smaller one. We got this, Tommy, me and you. And, and like also the fact that it's just an unspoken thing that a ship's boy has to fight if the captain fights. Well, yeah, you gotta you gotta back up your crew. That's fair, that's fair. I guess probably everybody has to fight if the captain is fighting. But like, <laughs> I don't know, something about it was just so funny. Imagine if this was Wintro, he would absolutely not be getting ready to fight. Oh no. He'd be preaching. Like <laughs> So it's very funny. But I think it again points out, like I said before, in the conversation, the tax got manager. I don't know what to call him. Minister. It says the the tax minister. The tax minister specifically says, like, you should be grateful the Chalcedians are here because the satrap has asked them to guard you. And then very next thing that we know about them is actually you have to pay for them. Satrap right. is not paying for them to be here. You, you are. You raise the tariffs. Like then what's <laughs> the point of the satrap? Like if he's not paying for I this. I mean, that's why they brought the proposal to use their taxes to fund their own ships to do yeah, it. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know. I think that just like really points to more of like they don't need him as it's feeling very <laughs> 1776 america to me <laughs> let's throw some tea in the harbor like <laughs> no those are valuable goods you can't do that <laughs> fair 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 <laughs> doesn't come to the fight though thankfully and tanira suddenly drops his voice and says i'll be presenting this to the traders council as you see fit sir i'm sure the minister purred Althea thought him a fool. A wiser man would have known better than to bait Tommy Tanira. She half expected the captain to strike him. Instead, he smiled a very narrow smile. As I see fit, he rejoined smoothly. Doesn't speak a word until they get back and says, Fetch the mate smartly now. Have him come to my cabin. And so all three of them gather in the captain's cabin and discuss. He pours out three jots of rum for each of them (laughs) and then says, it's bad. Worse than I feared. Not only are the Chalcedians tied up here, but the Traders Council hasn't even challenged it. Worse, the damn satrap has tacked more duties and taxes on to our trade to pay them to be here. You didn't pay them, Greg asked incredulously. Of course not. Some, someone around here has to start standing up to this nonsense. It may be a bit rocky to be the first one, but I'll wager once we've set the example, others will follow. The minister says he's going to detain us here. Fine. While we're tied up here, we take up this much dock space. A few more like us, and he won't be able to process ships or tariffs. Greg, you'll have a quiet word with Ophelia. Saw help us all, but I plan to give her free reign and let her be as unpleasant and bitchy as only she knows how. Let the dock workers and passers-by deal with that. Althea found herself grinning. <laughs> I just thought that <laughs> that paragraph was hilarious. Right. <laughs> what a punishment. Yeah. Ophelia, be a bother. You know Ophelia. Oh First of all, gosh. is already listening in. Second of Loves all, is it. like starting a list of all the things she can do to like be the most nuisance she can be. And she's so excited. Like she is putting her party hat on. She's ready. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ophelia was meant for this. <laughs> In the best way possible. That right. is not a, like <laughs> that's not derogatory. <laughs> so Althea is kind of excited, um, and anticipating something because this is the start. Yeah, right. She f- says it, it feels like a storm is brewing. Yes, and so something is happening. It's the precipice of something happening, and it's a big change. And I think. What's most interesting about this is this is really important and it is a big deal that Tommy Tanera is doing this because, like he said, this has been a very slow moving 
progression up into this point where mm-hmm. people haven't been realizing how much power they have been ceding to the newcomers right. just by allowing them to keep doing whatever it is that they want and ignoring them. And so he's taking a stand here. And that is a big difference because I feel like it's so against what we know of the Bing town traders. Like they don't want to make a fuss if that makes it like what we've seen so far at least is that they don't want to make a fuss and they don't want to make a scene and so the fact that now they're at the point where they want to make a scene you know it's serious and you know that they're taking this seriously right so she asks what she can do to help in this situation and he tells her just to go home take word to your mother of all you saw and heard I didn't see the vivacia in the harbor, but if she is in, I ask you to set aside your differences with your brother-in-law and try to make him see why we must all be together in our defiance. I'll be heading home myself in a bit. Greg, I'll be trusting the ship to you. At the first whiff of any sign of trouble, send Kelko to me with a message. Althea? Althea weighed his words, then nodded slowly. As much as she hated the idea of a truce with Kyle, Captain Tanira was right. It was no time for the Bingtown traders to be divided on anything. The smile that Tanira gave her was worth it. I suspected I could count on you, lass, Captain Tanira said fondly. Greg grinned at her, and I knew I could. They're striking. It's a sag after strikes. They gotta be (laughs) solid. Solidarity. Yes. They're all sticking together. But yeah, that I mean, it is big and it is a sign of maturation that Althea can see the importance of what is going on and decide to try and set their differences, her differences aside with Kyle if he's in. I mean, yeah. it never comes to that, but it's a huge step forward that in this hypothetical situation, she's like, yeah, I guess I could do that. Yeah, it's more important that we all stand together than I get my shit back, which I think is really noble. Mm -hmm. I think that is really impressive that even just in the span of a year, she's grown that much to be able to realize that it's not your personal stuff isn't always the most important thing happening. Right. And sometimes you have to set that aside. Like that is a lot of growth from her. A lot of growth from the first book, for sure. (laughs) It was all about me, me, me. (laughs) Yeah, I think definitely having a taste of real life has humbled her in a way that has been good for her. This is the most mature we've seen Althea this chapter Mm -hmm. because we have her mature and grown up and thoughtful take on the marriage. First off, that's probably because of a lack of passion Mm -hmm. between Greg and her. So if it was Brashen that was in this situation still as like a traitor's son or whatever, I think she would have jumped a little bit more headfirst into it. Mm -hmm. But at least we see some follow through with thoughts And then we have her realization that this is very important for Bingtown's future and her realizing that her father was right. Keep an eye on Bingtown politics because it's not just going sailing and trading and coming back and then leaving again. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it is good to see that growth. And to be fair, she is older, right? Like she's 19 now. It's been a year. She was 18 at the start. She's probably like, she was 18 or nine. I can't remember what we decided. Yeah. She's 18 or 19. She's 18 or 19 now, 1920. Like it's a little bit easier for that, like maturity and growth, especially when she's like getting out there, getting real world experience. Like I said, she's not just having yes men in her ear all the time or her dad being like, yeah, you're the best thing ever. She (laughs) has to prove herself. And I think, I don't think that makes means that she was like horrible before. I think she was still had talent. Obviously it just, she can has can see what the real world is actually like whenever you don't have the protection of somebody who just is always hyping you up in your corner all the time. Right. And so to be able to take from that and become a little bit more mature and a little bit more level headed about things, even when it is important. And it's not like the vivacia ship matter is not important in a lot of ways it's just that there are the most important important. thing yeah Yeah. and i i think that old althea would not be able to recognize that yeah so yeah like you said it's pretty big it's a good sign of her maturity i don't know i like it i've read a little bit into the next chapter what are it's also with althea it's her going back home what are you excited for what do you remember from it oh i have not read ahead so i know off the that's top what... of my head <laughs> it's been years off the noggin um i feel like it doesn't go super well 
I feel like there's some misunderstanding and a little bit of, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't know if there's like a big argument, but I feel like there is an argument that has a seed of like misunderstanding between her and her mom and Kefria still. Mm. And I, I feel like she doesn't put enough stock into Malta and what's happening with Malta. If I remember correctly, like I, I feel like she kind of is like, who cares about Malta? She's a kid. <laughs> I haven't read through the whole chapter, so I don't know for sure if she meets up with Kefria next time, but she and her mom talk. Mm-hmm. so you'll see you'll see yeah, what happens we'll see. see if that prediction just, is right i just remember like generally that they don't they don't not fix their relationship but i don't like it's not great i mean it's ronica we're talking about yeah right? she's ronica's never, never gonna admit she's wrong i think okay so this is <laughs> maybe a hot take malta is very much a um vestrit woman in that she has main character energy and kind of only cares about her own point of view on things. Yeah. I think that is something that I think that's something that all of the women have in common. Kefria included more like less than the other three, but Kefria Kefria still. just doesn't want to be involved. She yeah. just wants to be main character of her own world and like not be bothered of with her anything. own world where everything goes perfectly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but all the other ones are like, I need to be involved. Kefria is basic Barbie. <laughs> and Ronica is like math Barbie. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> No, Althea's weird Barbie, though. So <laughs> That's true. You know what? <laughs> no, Selden's weird Barbie. No one plays with him. <laughs> No, Nana's Selden. not here anymore. Who Sel- knows where Selden Selden's is? Selden's magic ear and Ken. <laughs> <laughs> True. No, Selden is, or no, sorry, not Selden. <laughs> Wintro is Alan. <laughs> <laughs> the odd one out. Right. Well, thank Doesn't you. Quite so- understand the world. Like, <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you have thoughts about which Barbie is who, <laughs> please uh, <laughs> please let us know. We're at isfitshappy at gmail.com. Or you can find us on any, any of our other social media links. You can go to isfitshappy.com and see there's a, uh, a button for more links there to go to our link tree. Or you can find us at uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and on YouTube. We're at isfitshappy on all of those. We look forward to hearing from you. All right, so we just have a short little talking point this time, and it's all about Ronica and Devad. Um, we definitely did a lot of talking in both parts of Chapter 7, where there's just a lot of confusion as to why Ronica and Devad are friends on our end, and especially my end, where I just don't understand how you could justify staying friends with someone who is so morally different than yourself. Right. And especially if it's something that you're not even comfortable, like bringing up to their face (laughs) that like, I don't know, like, how do you justify that as being a friend, whatever, blah, blah. blah. So we asked those questions and Cookie Baker had a response to how they see Ronica in this story. So Cookie Baker says, I think Ronica is a mixture of doing things the right way by society's rules and doing things her own way. She has a strong moral code of her own that is not based on following the masses, but doing things how she feels it's right. She will let Devad know to his face when he is being offensive. And I think when she's alone with him, she doesn't mind so much because she doesn't get offended by him so easily. But whenever he says things in front of others, that's when she gets flustered by him. Which is really interesting because... I I mostly agree with this comment and I find it to be really interesting because Ronica doesn't follow what currently the masses are doing and what yeah. the masses think is right. But she is a very traditional person as well. Mm-hmm. And the reason why he is so offensive to her, but she still sticks by him is because of those traditions right. and her pride and all that stuff. So I do agree with that. And I I think Cookie Baker hits the nail on the head with the social interactions. She can deal with Devad fine because she can take time or say bluntly to him, like, stop trying to 
make me pity you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not going to work. We're, we both got ourselves into this mess. Yeah. But if he says stuff like that in front of other people, she's trying to present herself as a proper lady of a Bingtown trading household. Yeah. And he throws a wrench into all that since he associates with her, which I think is where that that struggle comes from. Yeah, no, and I definitely think that is a good way to look at it, where it's in private versus in public, what their relationship is like. And I don't necessarily know that that I agree that she's less offended by the things that he does in private. Or, like, I, I don't necessarily think that's what Cookie Baker is saying, but I mean, I don't think it's that she is less offended and she just has to put on a show when other people bring up their right. offense. I think it's just... That some of it is not proper to talk about. And so she like as much as she is able to be blunt to him about when he's doing things wrong. She also isn't capable of doing that where when it matters Mm -hmm. like about slavery or whatever. Like she and Kefria have arguments about slavery pretty regularly according to Malta. But I don't know if she's ever talked to him about how wrong having slaves are at least from what we've seen. And She's talked about him with Kefria in between then. So I don't know. It just, is she really holding him accountable whenever it's just the two of him? I do like the sense of like, that's why she gets so flustered in person is because she doesn't want to look bad by being blunt to him because that is their relationship and she knows it won't offend him, but it could offend the other people of like, right. why would you talk to somebody like that in that manner, even mm-hmm. if they're being bad? Like, I don't know. So I get it. I I like that added flavor on top, but I don't know that I like, I don't know if I like fully believe it, but I do like the thought. It's a very interesting kind of dynamic between everybody. So definitely. So thank you, Cookie Baker, for bringing that forward and giving us more to think about with that relationship. And thank you, everybody else who writes in. It's been fun to hear from you guys. And we look forward to talking to you guys more next week. 